What's up guys, welcome to another video of the course Dynamic Programming for Beginners. We continue to explore the world of dynamic programming and today we are going to extend the climbing stairs problem from the previous lecture and look into a few other variations of this problem so that you have a really good foundation that we can build upon. If you haven't seen the previous video, I strongly recommend you to check it out so that you have a better understanding of what we're going to do here. The link is in the description. Alrighty, so let's recap what we've learned so far. We know what dynamic programming is, right? It's an optimization technique that can be used to solve different optimization and combinatorial problems. Last week we solved the climbing stairs problem and we also introduced a framework for solving dynamic programming problems. The framework consists of five steps. In the first step, we define the objective function, which is the function that you want to minimize or maximize in your problem. The second step is identify identifying base cases, which are basically the boundaries for your algorithm. In the third step, we need to write down a recurrence relation or a transition function, as I like to call it. The transition function is basically the function that takes the system from one state to another. The fourth step is identifying the order of execution, which is the order in which you are going to solve the problem. You need to pick which subproblem you are going to solve First, the order of execution will help you with the last step, which is the location of the answer. In the most cases, the answer to the main problem will be located somewhere in cache, in the data structure that you use to remember the results of the subproblems. Cool. Now let's get back to the climbing stairs problem. Just to remind you, the problem statement was to find the distinct number of ways to get to the top of the staircase. And there was a constraint that we were allowed to make either one or two steps at a time. Note that this is a combinatorial problem because we need to count things. We all know that when it comes to counting, we need to use the sum operation. The transition function we obtained was f of n equals f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. Why is it n minus 1, n minus 2? Because we are allowed to make either one or two steps at a time. So to get to the nth stair, we need to be either on the previous step or the one before the previous. Good. So now, if you remember, I asked you to try to optimize the space complexity of the solution we wrote. Let's do it now. All right, so here is my error. I've got the climbing stairs problem from the previous week and we need to optimize space complexity, right? So right now the space complexity is O of N and the reason why is because we allocate memory for N plus one elements. Uh, so it means that the higher the value of N, the more memory we need to allocate to solve this problem, right? So just to illustrate this idea, I wrote the utility function print memory that prints out the, the amount of allocated memory. So let's run this function for a high value of n and see how much memory is allocated. So let's say n is 1 million. I've got this test case here. Uh, so as you can see, we allocated 7.8 megabytes of memory. Um, whereas like for and when n equals to 5, we only needed 0 0.1 megabytes, right? So why is it 7.8? The reason is because in Go, uh, int is of size 8 bytes, so we need 8 bytes multiplied by 1 million and 1 elements, which is about 8 megabytes of memory needed uh, to, to, to keep this array in memory, right? So how do we optimize that? Uh, if we take a look at the recurrence relation at the transition function, we can see that we always access i minus 1 and i minus 2 elements, right? So the, the previous two elements. And it means that we only really need two variables here, um, which would give us access to the previous two elements. So if we take a look at, let's say when n equals to four, our DP array would look like one, one, two, and three, right? So the very first iteration, uh, this is this, this are our two sort of like variables. This is i minus two, and this is i minus one. And then the result is in the third variable. Uh, the second iteration, um, B is our A, and then C is our B. And then the result is in C. So as you can see, we just need three variables here. So let's do that. So we can drop the DP array, and we can say that this guy is A, that guy is B, and we also need C, which would be our answer. 
So we can say C equals A plus B, right? And then the result is in C. So now the only one thing that we need to do, uh, the last thing that we need to do here is to essentially shift A and B um, to make them the sort of like the new values, right? So as you can see here, um, our A is now B, uh, and then our B is now C. And that's pretty much it. So now the space complexity of this function is O of one. And let's check out how much memory is needed for this version of the problem of the function to work. Uh, let's run it again and boom, all the tasks passed. And as you can see, allocated memory is just 0.2 megabytes. Okay, cool. So now let's move on. And I, would I wanted to take a look at the another variation of this problem, which is climbing stairs, three steps. So it's pretty much the same problem, but now you can either climb one, two, or three steps at a time. So when you, you know, solve all of these problems, make sure that you always follow the framework that we outlined in our previous lecture. Uh, so the first thing we define the objective function is pretty much the same as the climbing stairs where you need to take, where you can to take two steps uh, at a time identify base cases. So now since we can make three steps, we need one more base case, right? So we need f of two equals to two. Uh, we can, you know, manually count that. Uh, and in fact, it will equal to two. Uh, and now the recurrence relation obviously becomes f of n minus three, right? The rest is pretty much the same. And we can now translate all of that into code. So we can say dp of two equals to, what is it, two, right? And now we need to start our loop from the third element or like rather fourth element and say um, our recurrence relation is now dp of i minus one, i minus two plus i minus three, right? So I already have the test cases for this version of the problem. Let's run it and see if it works. Yes, everything is good, which is great. Now, obviously you can, you can uh, apply the exact same optimization here. This could be just A, B, and C, and we, could, we would store the result in say D. Uh, I'm not going to do that now. All right, so now I want to take a look at another variation of this problem, which is called climbing stairs case steps. This could be like a follow-up question to the previous problem, right? So each time uh, you can climb one, two case steps at a time. Um, what's, the pro what's the process of solving this problem? Well, the process is pretty much the same. You need to follow the framework that we outlined in the previous lecture. So the first step is define the objective function. We already know the objective function uh, to this problem f of i is the number of distinct ways to reach the i-th stair and we can add by making one to k steps, right? Now identify base cases. Uh, so in this problem we have two vari variables, int and k. But for instance when k equals to two the recurrence relation is pretty much the same as the uh, recurrence relation of the previous function of the previous problem f of n minus one plus f of n minus two and it becomes you know, pretty obvious that when we have k, when we are allowed to make k steps, the recurrence relation would look like f of n minus one plus f of n minus two plus da 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 plus f of n minus k, right? Um, the rest stays pretty much the same. The order is bottom up and um, where to look for the answer is f of n, right? Now, the only thing that we need to do here is to translate the recurrence relation, um, the transition function into code. So let's do it now. Um, so in our current code, the recurrence relation is for when k equals to two, right? So this is wrong. Um, we need to solve this problem for any value of k, meaning it would be dp of a, uh, i minus one plus dp of i minus two plus dp of i minus three plus dp of i minus k. So how do we do that? Well, we can just add another loop. So we can comment that out and say for all the k's starting from one to k, right? Uh, j plus plus, 
um, we want to calculate the sum dp of i minus j. The only minor thing here that we need to worry about is that when i equals to let's say 2 and k equals to say 5 or like j equals to 4 we would access dp of negative 2 which would lead to an error right so we need to sort of like avoid calculating cases when i minus j less than 0. In this case we just want to sort of like continue and ignore the loop. And that's pretty much it. Let's try to run the test test tests for this function. I added all the tests from the previous two functions from the previous two problems when k was 2 and when k was 3. Uh, let's see if everything works. And all the tests passed, uh, which means that the function works as expected. Great. So so now, what's the time complexity of this function? So the first loop, we execute n times. We run it n times, right? And then the second loop we and is of size k, meaning that the time complexity is O of n by k. What is the space complexity? We allocate memory for um, n elements, which means that the space complexity is O of n. N. There is nothing else. We, we, we don't allocate any other memory. Uh, we could optimize this problem uh, down to O of uh, K uh, by doing pretty much the same optimization as we uh, did in the previous two problems. Uh, thank you so much. I hope this was useful and I'll see you next Sunday. Take care and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye guys.